All right, guys, we're here to talk about blesses now, and we're going to go over something during pretender creation that you always want to think about, which is the bless you take on your particular nation. Any bless you take could be taken for a multitude of reasons. It's sort of the same about what I said when we were discussing the original pretender discussion. You select your chassis or what pretender, what your pretender is going to do for you based on a multitude of reasons. So I'm going to give a couple examples. We'll do it in early age first, and I'll show you a couple examples, and then I'll show you how that changes changes to middle age and late age. Because there are a lot of misconceptions about middle age and late age. For example, just to cover one of those misconceptions right now, people say late age, everyone's heavily armored. While that's true for a lot of troops, that is not heavily armored. That is not heavily armored. That is certainly not heavily armored. So when people say, oh, late age is heavily armored, so it's not good, you know, to take something that's like a basic damage bless on it, it, it that doesn't make any sense. It's all about what you're facing and who you're against. There's a lot of troops that have, you know, 13 protection in late age, you know, then you have these guys which jack up their protection at 24 which gets kind of bonkers but you do have a lot of differences now it's a general trend independence will be more heavily armored but if you're struggling against independence you really need to be practicing expansion more anyway because i could start with a random nation and virtually expand without fail every single turn on any nation even ones that i haven't played before just by looking at basic stats and that's something we'll kind of go over a little bit here too while we're talking. So let's get back to the early age. Let's pick a nation. So let's pick just the first nation on the list. So we're looking at a nation. Does it say anything about sacreds up here? That's one of the things I like to check first. Philosophers are better at research in a slothful dominion. So let's take a look at their philosophers. Philosopher plus two, improved research in a land with sloth and worsened research in lands with productivity. Right there, that would make me want to, because these guys are very cheap. And if you look at their upkeep costs, they're extremely cheap for researchers. What you could do is you could look at philosophers as a major point and they can get up to, is it up to, or is it plus two per, it's plus two per. So if we go theoretically with sloth three, now we're talking 16 research guys for 90 gold. That's kind of insane. So there are a lot of things that you need to look at in your nation first to kind of dictate whether or not you really want to invest heavily in your sacreds. One thing I'd like to point out to people is a lot of times they look at their sacred and they go, wow, 17 protection, 17 defense, good hit points, not so great damage, good magic magic resist, great morale, great combat speed. Maybe I'll really emphasize these guys and focus in on a massive damage bless, just tons of strength. Maybe, you know, we go for something crazy like that, take a whole bunch of damage, strength of the earth times five and strength of the flesh times five. And now I've got plus 10 damage on all these guys. Now they're doing 24 damage, get a couple fire point, you know, whatever. The problem is with cavalry specifically, you haven't checked your mount stats. 10 protection at 13 is not nearly as good as 17 and 17. And the problem is compare the size size three for your little dude, size six for your Pegasi. So that means you're only fitting one of these goofballs per square. So no matter how high you get that damage, you're only doing 24 damage per square. It doesn't matter. And if they're flying, they're obviously not going to be flying with a size four melee unit running next to them, right? I mean, theoretically, they could land next to the melee units, but it's much harder to coordinate to fit an extra attack in that square. So you're looking at a tanky soldier on top of a not so tanky mount. And since the mount is a larger size than the soldier, it's it's more likely to get hit whenever arrows come flying into that square. The soldiers will target which one they attack on their own, but the arrows that fly into the square will target based on size. So you have twice as much of a chance of hitting Pegasi as you do hitting the Wind Rider. So that's something you really need to consider. See, your Wind Rider has 21 head protection, 17 normal protection. They're pretty immune to arrows, like short bows at least. An armored Pegasi, they have three head protection. Three. That's a far cry from thinking you have 17. So that's something you need to factor into a blessed. And and they're only recruited in the capital. Something like this, where it has a glaring weakness that is very easy to exploit. A whole bunch of short bows will massacre your sacreds. That's generally speaking, not a good start. Because even if you don't have good access to short bows, you have access to spells like flying shards and similar things that just throw around tons of damage or rain of stones. There's a lot of spells that just target heads specifically and really capitalize on things like this. Something that a nation like early age Ur suffers from because none of them have helmets. They have horns, so none of them wear helmets. You can really hurt Ur with a Reign of Stones cast. Something we're dealing with here is a big glaring weakness. So 1717 is nice. Damage is not great. Pegasi damage, there it's a hoof instead of like an alicorn from Middle Aged Man and similar nations. So you're really dealing with a sacred that has what I call too many holes to patch up. So if it has too many holes to patch up, you would need to raise their protection to make them reasonably tanky. You would need to raise their, if you wanted to go a defense route, you would need to raise their defense and then give them protection against arrows, which is not going to happen. So it's it's too difficult to make them super tanky to make them 
them survive, and they're only recruitable in the capital. That means you're going to have high attrition, and they're only recruitable in your capital, which means, let's say you have a Dominion score of six or seven, you're only going to be able to get six or seven per turn all game total. That's it. Now, these guys do have great map movement because they can move around by flying, obviously. But problem is, if you're only able to produce six or seven, do these really look like they're going to stand up to something else that can only be made six or seven at a turn? Let's check another nation out and see what we can find in early age to compare it to. How about these guys? Fire resistant, so basically immune to fire for all intents and purposes. Heat aura of six. Fire shield of eight armor piercing damage whenever someone hits them. Berserker three, so this protection goes up to 21 when they berserk. And that's also 21 for their head. Wasteland survival. Dark vision, decent in the dark. Fire power, so you gain a whole bunch of bonuses to your strength, attack skill, damage, etc. When you're in hot provinces, and as Abyssia, you're going to be pushing a lot of hot provinces. So that's a lot of times plus three, sometimes even plus four. Bad formation fighters. What this means, so this is something I'll explain in a little more depth because some people think this is minus two per, like he counts as a six size unit. That's not true. What it means is if you have nothing but formation fighters in one square, the total square loses a total of minus two. So instead of a square being able to hold 10 size points, now your square that's filled with only burning ones can only hold eight size points. So you can actually fit two of these guys in a square because I've heard that argument before. Oh, burning ones, you know, they get two attacks, but they're not, that's not enough to keep them up with other sacreds. Well, that's not true because you get four attacks per square because you have these two attacks for this guy and two attacks for the guy with him in the square. Just to clear that up. Ambidextrous always helps. Look at their base protection. Their defense is atrocious, but they're not leaning on defense. So if you shore up the protection, it covers up the defense skill. You could also take something crazy like a glamour bless to give the opponent a minus five to attack as opposed to worrying about these guys' defense because once they berserk, they're going to be a defense zero. But if you give your opponent minus five to attack, now it treat it doesn't care what your defense is at that point. It gives them minus five to attack. So it's treating you like you have five defense, even though you don't. Now it may not be enough. It may not be something you want to lean on, but it's something to consider. But compare this troop, 70 gold, 37 resources compared to 70 gold, 38 resources. Do you really think seven of these are going to be seven of these? Absolutely not. There's no way. There's nothing they're going to do that these guys can't do except move quickly. And once they get there, they're going to get beaten to death. And if you have a single short bow archer he has a reasonable shot at sniping out your mount that's it's just too many holes to shore up whereas this guy's holes are what combat speed his resists to cold poison lightning their magic resist is decent their morale is basically perfect because of berserker dark vision could be shored up a little gave them 50 percent dark vision now they see in the dark perfectly they're vulnerable to anything that targets spirit sight they don't have magic weapons and you can only fit two to a square but that's not bad for something with 23 hit points because that's sort of like pseudo giant size that's like mount size right mount have 25-ish hit points. These guys have 23. And given that their protection is 21 on the head and the body, and they have heat and fire shield to punish people for hitting them, because remember, if somebody hits you for one damage and takes eight armor piercing damage in return, generally speaking, you're doing really good. So it makes it a much better chassis to kind of focus around versus the Arcosafail Wind Riders. Now, not to say Arcosafail is a bad nation. This is a humongous strength, and they have a lot of other strengths. Air magic with nature magic. A lot of these different strengths you can abuse, especially with these goofballs. These mystics are really, really flexible, but the human nation and they don't have a good sacred. So we're not really going to focus on that. On a nation like this, however, if we were picking a bless, I would not pick it for my sacred. I would say, okay, 17, 17, little attack, little attack. I will use them like really expensive flying raiders and I won't worry about it. If I need a flyer, pick this guy. A lot cheaper. He's susceptible to fire. Who cares? He's a lot cheaper. He does virtually the same damage because this Pegasi is going to get repelled almost every time. This guy, he has the same basic attacks, just one attack. He's way, way, way cheaper. Cheaper, so you can pump out way more of these guys to go attack somebody's rear, if that's what you're going for. And if you really want to get back there, send some chariot archers back there. Go charge and back and shoot at people. And that would be what I would do with this nation. I would focus my bless around the mages. This is not a mage I would focus it around. It would be this one. Or yeah, they have awe six, which is insanely high. They have the ability to perform seduction with their stealth, so they could actually turn into fairly decent assassins. They're very expensive for an assassin. I don't know if I would ever think about that, because they are almost immortal as a misnomer here. They may live forever and may not be vulnerable to winds of death, but they are certainly not going to reappear in your base if they die. I would orient something around my bless like reinvigoration, something basic, and then try to go with scales. Yep, these guys heal disease, which is good. Let's see, anything special? Nothing really. So nothing special, really nothing. Mage engineer's nice, but not nice for a bless. Yeah, there's nothing here to really work on for a bless. So I would almost avoid a bless entirely for this nation, other than maybe a little reinvigoration, unless they have some summons that I'm not thinking about that they can bring out that are super sacred and super powerful. So a nation that we would go more heavy on bless would be obvious. The obvious is Pangea, right? When you look at Pangea, they have a sacred unit that has nine protection that bumps up to 12 when they berserk. Defense that drops down to 14 when they berserk.
berserk, but that's still pretty high. That's above normal. Combat speed of an insane 29. They have a bronze lance, which gives them half of their strength as a damage bonus on their first hit. So they're getting an additional seven damage here on their first hit for 21. So if you raise attack skill a little bit to guarantee that first hit, you're going to be thumping people pretty hard. The hoof, the javelin, I don't know how I feel about the javelin. It's got great attack skill for a javelin. Usually javelins have a terrible attack skill. Let's try to find one. There we go. Yeah, attack skill of eight because precision's not the greatest on it. Javelin's precision's minus two. So the fact that these Pangeans have precision 13 is pretty good. It makes their javelin volley pretty solid. And you can soften up a lot of opponents by having them, you know, fire closest and they run forward and throw javelins and light people up at first, especially if you do a strength bless without getting hit in return. That would be really great. In fact, if you are facing Abyssia, Abyssia is really slow, right? So, and they have a fire shield, but if you told your Pangeans to rush forward and throw their javelins, I feel like it would make a big difference. Let's actually go test that out now. All right, so let's take a look at this test battle of roughly the same amount of white centaurs and what we took on the white centaurs for a bless. Well, I guess I'll show you in a second. Okay. On the white centaurs, we took the bless of just pure damage. Strength plus 10, dark vision a little bit, fire resistance a little bit, attack skill, something reasonable. For the burning ones, we took plus five natural protection and reinvigoration. And we're seeing in this battle, we're throwing javelins at them. So let's see what happens when they come together and reach one another with all the javelins. Even with the plus five natural protection. Let's see if anything died. Not yet. Quite a bit of damage dealt. Nothing dead yet. Let's see what they do with the second round. The second volley. Now keep in mind, these guys have 21 protection everywhere. So this is one of the worst case scenarios for throwing javelins. But it does show we've already killed a burning one. If you look at the HPs here, we've got Marcata. What is that? Province defense? We've got 21, 13, 14, 16, 18, 11... 18, 15, 12, 11. You can see 3, 15, 16, 18, 19, 6. I feel like this is a very underutilized part of the Pangean White Centaurs is if you ever take a damage bless, look at this damage numbers. It may not be all of them, but we're talking about large amounts of damage here. And it might actually make the difference considering the Pangean White Centaurs are at a huge disadvantage when they're fighting now that they're in combat because this one's berserking. His protection's still only 12. He's already crippled, but his protection's still only 12, and they're doing 30 and 27 damage. They're going up against guys that do 28, 28, and have protection 22 now, you know? So it's kind of... It's kind of a disadvantage for the White Centaurs, but they might have won it with the, um... with the morale hitting them with the javelins first. That might have made the difference. Let's go test the exact same battle. All right, now what we've done is we've changed it. So it's the same battle, same setup, same blesses, same everything. So 21 to 22 protection. But the difference is instead of having these guys throw their javelins, I just have them running into combat and attacking. Let's see the difference. Let's see if it looks any different. Well, look at that difference. That was quick. Wow. Huge difference. So once the burning ones got into combat with the white centaurs without them throwing their javelins, huge difference. So that just goes to show you one thing that I was talking about with the battle between the white centaurs and the burning ones. It's how you use your sacreds that dictates how well they perform, not only what their stats are. A good bless is not going to carry your bad play. It's not going to. You need to find a way to play your nation as optimally as you can in addition to utilizing a bless to maximize your efficiency there. Let's do a good example of an extreme nation for a bless, Miklin. Most people know that Miklin is a good blood nation and a good bless nation, right? This kind of tips you off to it, the plus three bless points here. The one thing that people don't realize is that the thing right above this, Dominion does not spread unless blood is sacrificed. Although that makes new players nervous, this is one of the most powerful tools Miklin has to take an insanely powerful bless. Because ordinarily, what happens is if you pick, uh, let's say, the smoking mirror and you just max out, let's say you max out some rainbow bless and you say, actually, I want some incarnate only stuff. I want a heat aura and I want, you would never say this, but withering weapons. But then I also want Stygian flesh and I want a bunch of attack skill and I want a bunch of damage. And then let's take some undying since we double, we get the double benefit here with our Jaguar warriors. You take something insane like this, look at your points. If you really want the Stygian flesh and heat aura early, you're going to have to do something like this to get enough troops per turn to matter. You're going to have to do something like this, like this. You're going to have to go old. You're going to have to go death. 
death, maybe misfortune, and then bad magic. This is going to be your dominion if you do this ridiculous bless that doesn't make too much sense, right? We didn't even take fire resistance, so that's just a stupid one, but it doesn't matter. The point is, you have to take this, and most nations, their dominion spreads automatically, especially near a prophet or a pretender, so this dominion is going to be spread all over your nation and all your provinces. However, with Miklin, this seemingly disadvantageous trait is actually an advantage because we can only spread our dominion where we want it. Now, yes, you run the risk of getting dominion killed, but oftentimes in Dominion 6, people don't seem to be trying to dom kill each other nearly as much. It seems a little more difficult to do. So what you can do is you can actually just barely spread your dominion at all, and having a dominion like this doesn't hurt you hardly at all. Yes, it will hurt your capital. That's not where the majority of your income comes from. For the first year, sure. But after that, all the other provinces you get, if you don't spread your own dominion, you gain the benefit of just neutral dominion or some benefits from other people's dominions. Usually they're not positive. These are usually reversed in an opponent's provinces, but at least you're not suffering from this, right? So if you made this more reasonable, we took away five bless points. Let's keep these up at five. Let's reduce these down by a couple. Let's say we did that and we wanted, we wanted a reasonable dominion suffer, right? There we go. Something like that, where you really emphasize the blood magic so you can really empower that. Attack skill, strength, undying withering weapons, Stygian flesh. We have another bless point. Let's take another undying point that helps our Jaguar warriors out. Now, the reason a build like this would be beneficial to you is because you'd take a terrible dominion, but you wouldn't spread your dominion. So you would be recruiting five Jaguar warriors. Also, just to be clear, the reason, the other reason Miklin is so strong, you have three sacred troops here and a bunch of sacred commanders that you can put the bless on. So the main guy in the early age is the Jaguar warrior. And the thing that makes him the main guy, well, two things is one, you can see he's not only recruitable in the capital, the other two sacreds are. But secondly, he has a second form, the Jaguar form, which I'll pull up on screen now so you guys can see it from the mod inspector. And his Jaguar form has a second set of HP and does decent damage as well. Completely different form, more HP, etc. And when they get killed, they basically switch. Well, the advantage to Undying is when this gentleman gets all the way down to zero hit points, he's still alive. So then he takes two more points of damage. He's still alive because Undying 2 gives you four additional HP. When he gets the negative four, he will quote unquote die and become a Jaguar. Now that Jaguar will have full HP and the benefit of the four undying HP again. So you're basically getting eight undying HP instead of four because it doubles. One thing we look at, they have good damage. They have a moderate attack skill and the Jaguar warrior itself, when he transfers over into the wear Jaguar, he actually gets, as you can see, 18 hit points and he has three attacks, a bite and two claws, which basically any damage buffs you take on here are going to make this really hard hitting and his 15 damage bite, 13 damage claws are going to gain the triple benefit of a damage buff. So if you do a buff like this where it's plus five strength, this guy's damage, I believe he gets an extra 25%. Yeah. So it's going to count as five and a quarter, actually six and a quarter because we took five, right? Yeah. So six and a quarter damage on here. He's going up to 26 slash 27 damage. And then when he switches over to his wear Jaguar form, he's going to be doing 21 damage instead of 15 and 19 on each of his claws instead of 13. So now you have an absolute blender killing people and he has the undying so even if you hit him with say rain of meteors he's going to be surviving two hits instead of one you can't just one hit or quitter him unless you soul slay him or something dramatically specific so a bless like this although these scales look impossible to take on a nation like micklin you can actually take scales like this and survive with that's something that you can consider now some other people might say oh i don't care about misfortune i believe in the misfortune math man that's rough to do for me but if you do hey do that and then you're not suffering as much but remember when you do this you're getting an additional MR on all of your troops because your MR is only 10 on these guys, 10 on these guys, 10 on these guys. That makes them extremely vulnerable late game to battlefield wide spells that target the mind or make them make an MR check. Any kind of effect that makes them make an MR check, it makes them very vulnerable. So there are a lot of things to consider. So let's go through and let's be dramatically specific with this nation. Let's say we wanted to play something crazy. This is one of the best chassis I can imagine just for cost, especially for a bless focus. So let's pick this one and see what we can do with the smoking mirror. If you were going to cripple your nation's dominion, if you were going to make it bad, if you were going to take penalty points, look at what you're facing. Let's say we're against Abyssia, Naba, and a couple other neutral nations. Well, that's a lot of fire. So maybe instead of crippling yourself like this to get extra points, you cripple yourself like this to get extra points because that sort of counteracts them. And then generally speaking, you're fighting in a fairly neutral dominion because an Abyssian dominion battling with yours, the battlefield's probably going to be your orienting right around fire one instead of hold one or fire three. So you're probably going to get more of a benefit there. And the Abyssian 
Americans are going to lose all the benefits, right? Death growth, this is only going to affect your capital. So in general, I think death is something you could very easily take. Now, magic drain, I would not want to cripple my magic research because if you look at your nation, 15 research takes one turn to recruit, right? Not bad. 13 takes one to re recruit. 13, 13. Where's the Nawalas? There they are. Nawalis. 11 to only takes one turn to recruit. You have a good research nation. So you could take a crippling penalty. And the other thing you have is you have access to lightless lanterns and similar boosters that you can take. Buff your research up. So you're not exactly hurting for research. But if you go this way, you do get a lot of benefits of opposing nations having their magic resist lowered. And I don't know if you know this, but you guys sort of specialize in blood. And blood has a lot of MR checks or die. So it's really something to consider. This is the, probably the hardest choice you would have to make choosing Micklin because this is going to dictate what your researchers get as a benefit or a penalty in your home province. So I would really look and I would consider very carefully what you wanted to do with your home province for this particular point. So let's just leave it neutral for now. Misfortune, fortune, that's only going to affect your home province. Let's see if we have any fortune tellers. Nothing there. So we don't have any fortune tellers that we can abuse in our home province. Protect us from misfortune. So that's something you really have to consider in your home province. But again, it's one province. Pretty much anyone that'll tell you the, the fortune or misfortune scale scales dramatically with number of provinces because you can only have a certain amount of events overall. So if you actually go misfortune completely, you would actually be decently served doing that on a nation that didn't spread its own dominion, right? So that's something you could consider. Now we've already tanked three scales. We have 600 points to play with and we're awake. Now imagine if that's all you wanted to do, because let's say you're fairly new, you look at these resources and you go, okay, if I need an Eagle Warrior for flying, which is really good, that's always a good trick, is if you get in trouble and someone's attacking your capital, get some flying warriors with your damage bless that have two attacks, they can hurt pretty bad. And it makes it so you have something that they don't expect. Or even better, like Abyssia comes running in, these guys resist fire and they have javelins. You can actually do a ton of damage like I just showed you with the white centaurs from Pangea, throwing javelins that are boosted by your huge sacred bless of say plus 10 damage. You're hitting people like trucks and just breaking them in half. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look. This is our primary guy. Remember, he has one attack at 20 plus and then three attacks at 15, 13, and 13 plus. What can we do? Do we want to, since we can recruit these anywhere, do we want to focus on keeping our guys alive? Maybe, but if we do want to keep them alive, we only want to keep them alive against what? Battlefield wide spells. So if they get a five resistance to most elemental magics, that will make them very, very, very tanky for our purposes. Let's pretend we're emphasizing the three that we're good at because then the points are all the same. You see 96, 96, it's the same. So we're basically maximizing our points across. We still have some design points left so we can get quite a few recruits, five per turn. We could even go as far as this and then take one more penalty. If you're looking at our troops, do any of these guys take high resources? Does anybody? Not really. I mean, these moon warriors and backup normal troops, sure. But since you're doing a huge bless, you don't really want to focus these guys anyway. So no, okay, but still less than recruitment points, recruitment points. So one good thing to do would be cripple your productivity to get yourself that extra troop per turn or even do it twice like that. That would not be a problem for this nation at all. So that's something I would seriously consider. And we still haven't touched magic and we still haven't touched order, which is going to give us recruitment points, which are fairly high on this troop, as you can see. Not so high on the Eagle Warriors and not so high on the Sun Warriors, but on the Jag Warriors, very, very high. So now we have a decent spread. We can pick, and let's say we're against, I would pick my resists based on the nations I was against and what they were bringing. If we were against Kalem, probably do this. Heck, if we were against Kalem, I'd probably do that, right? That would cause them a lot of problems because lightning and thunder can spread pretty well. Let's say we're against, let's say we're against Kalem, Abyssia, and Pangea. So we know we're going to be facing some poison. We're going to be facing some shock. We're going to be facing some fire. Those are easy resistances that we just gave ourselves that make our troops more resistant to battlefield wide spells. So they're not going to cast firestorm and immediately eliminate our entire army. I would pick an, a bless based on how to make these guys killy for the back line and how to make these guys killy with their javelins and how to make these guys killy up close. Now, if you look at all three of these attack rolls, it's 11 and 12. You've got 13 and you've got 11. So we could use some attack skill boosts. We definitely could. What are the forms of attack skill boosts we can get? Well, we can get attack skill. What else can we get here that you might see if, if your troops die off at righteous wrath plus three attack skill? That's pretty common because you're not going to be buffing your troops too much. So they're going to be dying quite often. Nothing we can see here. Are we going to get surrounded? No. So awareness won't help us a lot because we're going to have three to a square. So we're going to be surrounding people, if anything. No attack skill here. No attack skill here, though we do have strength of the earth, which is damage. Very important to remember. Spirit sight. That would help. Do we have any spirit sight on these guys? No. Do the wear jaguars have spirit sight? No. So now we know spirit sight might be something we want to focus on so that we can't be fooled because this troop doesn't have dark vision on these guys. So one way that people would cripple us would be cast darkness or any have any kind of glamour or blur buffs. So that's something we could consider is spirit sight. That would really help us with our attack skills. Anything here? Nothing really. Withering 
weapons is always dangerous, especially with flyers. Nothing here. Nothing really here, although true sight would help kind of the same as spirit sight. But if you're paying three points for a true sight and you already have the point, like the death and astral, you might as well spend the extra point and get the full spirit sight. And strong blood, but we also have blood surge, which gives us plus three attack, plus three strength, plus one defense and reinvigoration. This is really powerful as well. Something I would consider, how many points do we have? We have 18 points to play with. Let's see what happens if we make our troops, every time somebody dies, everyone around them gets buffed. There we go. Now we have 14 points and our stats on our base Jaguar warrior at 11 and 20, we would immediately go up to plus three attack, plus three strength. So we would go up to 14 attack skill and basically four points of damage. So 24 damage. We'd be doing 24 damage. And then our wear Jaguar would be doing 19, 17, and 17. That's pretty killy, especially since their attack skills are all 12 for the wear Jaguar. And that turns into 15 now. That's not including experience. So it just gets higher from there. That's a pretty big boost. And we know that some of them are going to be dying, right? Because we're not protecting them from to be invincible. We're not taking a defense bless. This is a really good benefit because if you run, see the downside to blood surge is if you ever run up against somebody who is a huge thug or super combatant with these guys, how much damage do they really do? Because the thug's not dying in one hit. The super combatant's not dying in one hit. Someone comes to the super combatant, a bunch of wear jaguars standing around not able to damage him at all. You're in trouble, right? 24 damage is great, but it's not good enough to beat a 30 protection super combatant. So blood surge suffers from that. Now blood surge will help you against ordinary troops, but the damage you already have helps a lot against ordinary troops because 24 damage hitting somebody like a truck down to 19 is going to be murdering most troops until you get to the very late game where you're casting buffs on yourself anyway, like armor piercing weapons and similar things like that. I would say we've got plenty of damage already just with the Righteous Wrath. And if you want to get to that damage a little faster, take a look around. You could pick an attack skill. You could pick something else. That's the point is now we're already killy enough. This is the point in the Sacreds where I would go, wow, we kill a lot of people. But this also depends on us dying. Maybe once we kill somebody, we want our guys to become even more killy. So let's do the Blood Surge focus. That'll make us more killy, more defensive, and better reinvig. Because our defense is 10, I believe, right? Oh, 11. It'll go up to 12 if we proc this. That's not bad. 13 defense goes up to 14. 10 defense goes up to 11. It's not bad. It slightly reduces the amount of times we get hit. So, but in addition, we also get the plus three attack, plus three strength. If you have both of these together, you have plus six, plus six, and reinvigoration. So now your troops, now reinvigoration is not a huge problem for these guys. They only have encumbrance four. These guys have encumbrance six, and these guys have encumbrance five. So you're not suffering a ton, but it does help. And now your reinvigoration, because if any of your mages kill anyone, it'll boost them as well on their reinvigoration. So, and believe me, with a nation that has this much blood access, you're going to be running blood communions. Reinvigoration is the greatest thing on the planet for blood communions. You always have the blood spell reinvigoration where you can remove all his fatigue and you can do the same for all your slaves. If you're in a Sabbath, we're getting a little too deep in the woods now. So let's just say a basic new player wants to play Miklin. They want to try to emphasize their sacreds and they want to try to kill people with their sacreds. Okay. We have good fire resist. We have good shock resist, good poison resist. So we're doing good against Pangea. We're doing good against Kayla. Maybe not great, but good. We're doing good against Abyssia. Maybe not great. Now we look, we have plenty of damage with Righteous Wrath and Blood Surge. So as soon as somebody dies, their damage goes up and then that increases the chances they kill somebody. So their damage might go up. I like this one better just because when you have hordes of units, not every single little unit's going to get a kill, but now all the hordes of units get buffed. We can go with this. And then let's say we just want them to be more killy individually. We could do something crazy like Strength of the Earth a couple times. But remember, we have 24 damage. We just did a test where the javelins that we were throwing with Pangea were doing 20-ish damage to 22 protection on the burning ones. And it was killing them plenty enough. So maybe we could take a point or two. But one thing we could really abuse here on Jaguars especially, because I had already talked about how the Undying HP duplicates. Well, so does the normal HP. So if you take something such as Undying 5, not only do you make your mages more tanky by a lot, because they all have an extra 10 HP, but now your Jaguar warriors have an extra 20 HP effectively. Then what would you want? Well, if they're in the Undying, they're dead after the combat, right? But if you have something like a weak regeneration, like 0.5 HP per round and plus one magic resist, we already know we suffer from low magic resist. This would be really good as well. Enchanted Blood to get us plus five HP per round to maybe save some of our troops and pretenders from dying at the end of the battle. Something you could consider. We could do something like this. And then what would we take for an extra point? Superior morale, no undead, not really any good undead or demonic leadership. So that would be a good one. I would take undead command or resilient. You could even take resilient. Oh, we forgot to take spirit sight. That's something I would consider. So now here's, here's a good point. So let's say I took undead command and then I went, uh oh, I forgot to take spirit sight. What's one thing we can do? Well, do you see incarnate only next to any of these blesses? No. Do you think this Jaguar is going to show up for you as a pretender and help you expand? No. Now he's going to help you research, sure, but you don't really need help researching in this nation. So one thing you can consider, if you hit this point where you're like, wow, I'm pretty satisfied with what my sacreds have here, I would I would like to give them a little more though. You 
can do this and make yourself dormant and take a couple more points. So let's say you really wanted to emphasize blood, so we went there. And believe me, going to claim life from ashes to ashes is and heavenly fire is a good thing. So let's say we go there. Let's say we said, okay, we're not too good at the glamour, right? We don't have any glamour here. Maybe we want our guy to open up glamour spells and glamour summons. Fire, astral, nature, water. Okay, so we don't have much earth. We don't have much air. And we always want astral to be higher if possible so we don't get sniped by a mind hunt. Let's do those extra points. Give ourselves five blessed points. Now we can pick spirit sight. So we're not going to be tricked with anything silly like that. That's something you could consider. Some people back in the Dominions 5 used to take magic weapons. Almost always did I recommend this for Micklin because magic weapons were insane when they were not incarnate. But now they're incarnate only. So now you're making a choice where you have to go, hmm, I need my pretender to be alive for this to work. Magic weapons working in the late game is fine because that's when everyone gets ethereal anyway and all those kind of things like invulnerability. So that would be helpful. But spirit sight will help you all game long and it's not incarnate only. That's something you could consider. And now you have an extra point. So instead of see this undead command as one point, we have one bless point left, which I'm pretty sure everyone's familiar. The one bless points aren't the super powerful ones. You can remove that undead command and go, hmm, what can I get for another two bless points? Let's say you really want to focus on killing Abyssia. Take another fire resist. Oh, I want more attack skill just to start the fight off. Take another attack skill. Oh, I don't want to get annihilated by lightning bolt and thunder strike. Okay, take another shock resist. I want some reinvigoration for my mages. Okay, take that. Want some more damage. Take some strength. You now have two points. You could even take half dead because then they're disease resistant and they don't need to eat. That's a good one. Now you don't need food. Don't need to worry about diseases. There you go. Let's say we do that. Now we don't have to worry about carrying around food. And if we're fighting in Abyssian death provinces and they've killed all their population, we don't have to worry so much about that. There you go. That's a, this is not an optimized bless at all, but you can see where the power is, right? Because no bless is perfect. But now what you have is you have troops. Actually, I'll start up a test game and I'll show you what the troops look like. Actually, I'll imprison myself to go a little more extreme, give myself some extra bless points and see what we can get with these extra bless points. There we go. Maximize that out, get five more points. That would be hilarious. That would be interesting against Kalem. All right, there we have our final guy. We have a good rainbow mage coming out imprisoned. We have eight dominion strength, zero order, two sloth, one cold, two death, two misfortune, zero magic drain. And then what we have is fire resistance times two. I took for the Abyssian matchup. I threw a little cold in there to really screw over Kalem because it's really funny to kill Kalem with flyers when you're the better flyer. Shock resistance against them as well. Righteous wrath for the damage. Spirit sight to avoid any blur based displacement, glamour, that sort of thing. And you can also fight in the dark so we could cast some darkness of our own. Undying 10, basically. Undead command just to help us out with carrying around and ferrying demons late game. Half dead so we don't have to feed them, which won't be a concern in our test game, obviously. Poison resist. Enchanted blood for the regen, hopefully to save some people with undying, but also just to make them slightly more tanky with the magic resist. And blood surge. So now we'll see. We'll name this guy Video Guy. All right, so what we did here is we set up a set of battles in the same game between Kalem, Abyssia, and Pangea from that bless we made earlier. And now we have, I basically did a time-controlled build of each one, and they built the amount of troops they would normally build. They summoned the amount of summons they would normally summon around year one and a half with the same research and everything else. And the thing is, with Micklin, you get a bunch of blood summons, such as the bats, the beast bats, and the frost fiends, and a couple different varied things. I tried to get one general army of just crap shoved together to see what would happen. A couple blood summons of fiery amps, little weak creatures that just go around and fight, a couple basic jaguar toads, things like that. And for Kalem, I got the basic army. I've seen Kalem put up ogres summon to hold the lines along with some temple guards. I've actually seen somebody do this exact setup, the double sparse covering each other. A bunch of archers in between with frost bows and regular short bows. A bunch of air mages in the middle and before they get thunderstrike, they get this. They start getting into death a little later. This is just a basic setup that I've seen before, or at least close enough to it. So we'll see exactly what kind of impact our Jaguar warriors with their bless have on this battle. Specifically, that's what we're watching. We don't care if Micklin wins or Kalem wins. This, these are not specifically set up battles for one side to win versus the other. They're just set up to be even battles at the same point in time. They have the same amount of research, and I followed basic research paths for all nations and basic summons based on the day that they could, etc. I made everything as realistically timed as possible, including throwing gems on mages to be able to cast tons of air spells and other things like that, and summons. So we'll see what this looks like. Okay, so that's Storm. You know Kalem's gonna be bringing up Storm, and then immediately the lightning bolts start, which is aggravating, but it happens. And you're going to get Storm, which causes a lot of flyers on this side not to be able to take off. For example, these guys, so they're just gonna be walking. That actually hampers Micklin quite a bit. And you can see the Micklin mages are throwing a lot of like body ethereal and small buffs all around while these guys are summoning air elementals and similar things. 
Looks like the Jaguar Warriors are causing a lot of problems in here. Whereas the HP summons are surviving quite a bit, pretty well with the enchanted blood we have going on here. Although, <laughs> this is a frog with dementia, of all things. Looks like our Jaguar Warriors are hanging on pretty well here. Yep, that HP regen is just paying off big time towards the end. Okay, so against an equivalent Kalem army, it looks like we won. Let's see how bad it was. 31 kills by the High Priests. There we go. Jaguar Warriors, 200 kills, and we only lost 13. So that's the benefit of the Bless that we happen to take. Now let's go try it out against some other nations. All right, and here we go with Pangea, with a ton of archers, which they almost always have, with longbows, which will punch through pretty much anything we have on Miklin. And we have a bunch of white centaurs, a whole ton, a bunch of buffs coming out, protection buffs, and we'll see what happens. You can see the white centaurs got wiped out pretty quickly by our jag warriors. Oh, and morale route. So let's see what happened here. Beaten by Pangea. But look at that. 167 kills by the Jaguar Warriors. And what did they die to? Primarily Archer Fire. Yep, the Longbows. Sure enough, that takes them out. That'll do the majority of the damage to them. White Centaurs did a decent job too, but they were also Hellblessed. So that makes sense. But as you can see, Hellblessed Jaguars do a ton of damage. Now, granted, you would have wanted to completely structure this fight differently for a Pangean fight, but it doesn't really matter. We're just trying to set up a combination of fights so you can see how effective this sort of bless is. And here we have a battle with Miklin versus Abyssia, which which frankly we should lose because Abyssia has tons of fire damage, heat, fire shield. And at this point in research, the only things we really have are a little bit of fire resistance. But on most of our blood spawn troops and random troops, we don't have any fire resistance. And most of our damage spells are fire spells. So it's a bit of a disadvantage here, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, and the fire imps don't really do anything in this battle for us. Oh, our flyers got in there. Go Flyers, get them. The advantage is speed. Come on, devils, hold on. Well, okay, they did enough. They did enough. Now the Jaguar Warriors up here trying to survive the heat. I'm actually curious, one of these Jag Warriors, what's going on here with the heat? How well do they resist it? Zero points of heat fatigue damage, zero points, zero points, lots of heat fatigue resist, six points of fire damage, well, from a fire blast, okay. Morningstar's obviously gonna hurt. Morningstar, yeah, normal damage is killing them. Fire damage from what? Hit burning one in the leg, this must have been, yeah, this must have been fire shield. Good, so they're resisting most of the fire damage, even though they're diseased and weakened, doing their best, living their best life at negative three hit points. I don't think these fiery imps understand how useless throwing flames is. It's really not helping. In fact, they're probably killing us. There we go. Got some beast bat routes. See, so we hit them with a lot of agony spam, which helps a lot with the morale, but they resisted most of the fire damage. But that seemed pretty effective. Even though our Jag Warriors didn't seem able to punch through their 22 armor very well, they did survive. So let's check it out. Burning Ones obviously killing the most with their Hell Bless. Armor negating, Flame Life spells, Beast Bats killing a little bit. Jag Warriors still doing the best on our team, even though we're severely outmatched in terms of that setup without more prep, obviously. They still did the most, and they managed to hold the line the longest. So that's what you can do with a decent Bless. Now let's go talk about other options. So now we looked at Video Guy as a generic bless good against three other nations that you knew you were going to face in one battle, and it was a generic enough bless that it seemed to work virtually for everybody except Pangea. And why is that? We didn't take anything to protect us from archery. So if we don't protect ourselves from archery, what are we vulnerable to? Archery. And that's how you have to play your blesses. Let's take a look at a middle age nation and try to figure out something a little different and how we would structure it differently. Let's say we have the same nations, Pangea, Abyssia, and Kalem. So let's look at the differences. Kalem, little tankier, still same frostbow, still same elephants. 
Still same virtual Stormguard, just a little more heavily armored. Short bows, same sort of thing. Little less air magic, but not much less. No real death anywhere anymore, except here, obviously, in their high seraphs. So it's virtually the same troops. So same sort of protection you'd want for them. Against Abyssia, however, the Burning Ones have changed quite a bit. They're now Lava Warriors. They still can only fit two per square. Berserk, Heat, Fire Resist, looking virtually the same, maybe a little worse overall because the protection's the same, their Berserker's the same, so they're not turning out as good, less hit points, if I remember correctly, but a little cheaper. Mages are a little different, got some Demon Breads, a little more Blood Emphasis. They're going a little more in the Blood Emphasis thanks to Malfoss's influence. Still have the same virtual setup, and that's what I was saying about you have to pay attention to the actual troops, is if the actual base troops of this nation still have 17 protection, Heat 3, and Fire Resist 25, it's virtually the same way to fight them, or rather, if you're smart as Abyssia, you pick up the flails for the two tacks per round. It's the same virtual fight. Now, Pangea, I believe, changes quite a bit because their guys get, these guys stay the same, the white centaurs, but their war minotaurs get more heavily armored. Their centaur warriors stay the same, if I remember, but their cataphracts become more heavily armored. Yeah, there we go. Much more heavily armored. Two attacks, still tough. But as you can see, a lot of it's the same. Maybe a little more emphasis on blood magic if someone really wants to go with pandemoniacs and a little less emphasis on high nature. And there's virtually no glamour in this nation anymore unless they get one or two from these guys. Let's see. There it is. The one glamour. So you're dealing with less glamour, a little bit of a shift in magic paths. But if you were setting up a bless for Miklin in this in this age, you would have to look because your nation completely changed. Right now you have these Koatals, which are very powerful spellcasters. You have some good air access. You have basically the same priests otherwise and virtually the same troops. But look at the difference. These guys can now only be recruited in the capital. So they're one of your like once in a while recruits. Same with the Sun Warriors. But now you have unlimited flying eagle warriors in every province. See, and that's the one thing about our example battles that wasn't really legitimate is we should have had about triple the amount of Jaguar warriors we had for an even match because what you want to do is build temples everywhere and spam those Jaguar warriors out with temples in forts so you can start spamming tons and tons and tons of the sacreds and you summon tons and tons of sacred blood summons. Now in this age we would have to focus on the eagle warriors which are a little less powerful compared to the Jag warriors but they have the obvious advantage of being flying so you might want to consider a kind of bless that involves you know maybe storm immunity or storm flight that might give you something that because otherwise somebody's countered you would immediately be storm and stop you from flying especially going against Calum. you know that's coming but otherwise the same thing you look at the basic stats you go hmm two attacks decent attack not great but it's a zero length so it's probably going to get repelled length three though attack one, 11 damage 13 protection of only seven and seven on the head do you know they're going to die so you would take advantage of stuff like righteous wrath you would take advantage of anything that you wanted depending on how killy you wanted them to be if you wanted to treat them like your super killy snipers you could just go with pure damage and load these guys up so they're doing 23 and 21 damage with their attacks and give them a few attack skill bonus points you know something like that so these are you have to remember the primary sacred that you start your nation with is not always the answer so now when you're dealing with Micklin completely different right completely different nation so you'd have to set up your whole bless completely differently to get it going powerfully and you still have powerful priests which is not a problem plenty of blessing options but now you're not able to cripple your dominion because now it's going to spread everywhere now you're dealing with cold in every province now you're dealing with death in every province so it becomes a little more expensive but as you can see from all the nations that are in middle age you're dealing with yes a general increase in protection on troops that you could possibly get and a couple new unique nations like Ermor. middle age is very unique i'll be doing a guide on them soon i love playing Ermor. you know somebody like ulm who's super 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 heavily protected so you really have to be able to punch through even if you put plus 10 damage on your micklin flyers they're barely going to be able to hurt a black knight 23 protection versus 23 damage although you think 23 damage is crazy against those guys it's not and then they're going to recruit a couple of these guardians to annihilate your entire square if you're facing guardians and you're planning on going super sacred it might be worth a bless to take larger to make less of your sacreds fit into one square so you can resist this more a little something to think about on the side and then let's take a look at late age because late age we do have a lot more tanky options for every nation options in general get tankier and defense goes up a little bit but the big importance here is mage paths go down and although that may seem like it makes blesses less effective it doesn't in reality late age since spell casting is more difficult it actually makes blesses a little more powerful if you're smart with how you do it if you're fighting somebody with a banefire crossbow and you're giving these guys precision and sniping the opponent and decaying all of their troops before you go into battle and close battle or close ranks with them you're actually getting quite a big advantage and don't get me started on late age statists how they can reanimate and have hundreds of those little tomb worms running around that's a whole different story when you're dealing with people with higher armor in general remember there are still troops like these guys that come out and chop them up for breakfast a lot of these guys don't care the big difference is i would say in late age is not
not the armor, but I would say the punching power of all these troops. They can hit like trucks in the late age. 17, 17, and then a third attack at 16. Like that's heavy duty damage you're looking at. Obviously, when we're dealing with these guys, you've got monstrous attacks on these guys. Late age, I always feel, has a lot more monstrous attacks. And so it's kind of better to be almost, even with Raga, look at that, two attacks at 18, an attack at 18, an attack at 17. That's ridiculous. Although they did nerf these guys with the, uh, what's the requirement? Something about, oh yeah, they count as two holy points to recruit. So you get way less of these guys. Thank goodness, man. Every time you face Raga in Dominions 5, they had a hundred of these dudes flying around just taking all your provinces with one priest leader and then five or six of these. Good luck stopping that. But basically with your blesses, you want to orient your blesses to do a specific role for yourself. Do not be the person who makes a mistake and makes your bless something that's all encompassing and covers everything. Unless you're doing something completely different, like I just need my troops to survive everything so my mages can annihilate you. That's something you could consider. If you had a nation like Ind, you could easily take just a super defensive bless to keep these guys alive forever. It wouldn't work very well because they only have 12 hit points, but you'd be surprised how long you can drag out these guys surviving if you protect them well enough with resistances and other things to keep them alive so that your astral dominance of the battlefield can just annihilate everybody. Heck, you could even give these guys astral tempest. If you get if you get end mages to cast astral tempest, targets the battlefield with one armor negating damage, and then you give all your troops the bless enchanted blood to resist that, you're going to be doing quite a bit of damage to people on the battlefield with this one. MR negates so that the enchanted blood helps even more. And then you just have your troops hold the line while your mages just annihilate the enemy. It's just generic ideas. Now, we've talked quite a bit about blesses and how we can use them to abuse things. Just remember, when you guys emphasize bless this heavily on a nation, you always need to understand when you're looking at the cost of troops, this is a terrible example for what I'm about to talk about, so I'll pick another nation. When you look at the cost of relative troops, an Ahiman Onkite is usually a very expensive troop, very resource intensive, takes a lot of investment to use, but the more points in pretender creation that you spend on blessing them, for example, if we wanted to go with a regen bless and we did this, we've now made these troops relatively more expensive than any of these troops. Because if you just wanted to recruit a bunch of Boshanites, you could do that. You could easily do that if you wanted your, let's say you wanted your pretender to be alive, you went with extra heat to get yourself a little extra productivity, went with a little misfortune, went with a little order, and went with a little drain to get more productivity. There you go. Now you could produce a whole bunch of these Boshanites, but you are paying for it with drain and misfortune. Whereas if you did not take this regeneration bless, you instead removed that from the equation and you just went like this. Now you can have back to normal heat, two growth, or one growth, zero misfortune, one magic, or one misfortune, zero magic. See, and this makes your other troops relatively cheaper in the grand scheme of gold and income. Because the big thing about Dominions is income. You always have to factor everything in to income and see what's the best bang for your buck. My recommendation, that's my generic recommendation. In general, if you're looking at a nation to summarize, and you see a nation that has something like this, only recruited in the capital, not super great, easily countered because they have no helmet, so they have a two protection on their head, good at HP, but it looks like you have something here. Decent damage, decent HP, solid protection and defense, but they don't have two attacks. The only thing really stand out about them is bodyguard. Their protection on their head is terrible. Don't invest heavily in these guys because you can only get a certain amount per turn. And because of that, you really can't expand your forces in a way that tax the late game effectively. In a small blitz, sure, giving these guys a bunch of fire shield and a couple damage buffs might be fun and you might be able to hurt some people, but people are going to be able to come and annihilate them just by archery fire. And there's nothing you're going to be able to do to fully prevent that without an overinvestment in that direction, which you probably can't do because of an overinvestment in your bless. So just try to find something, look at your nation, for example, Abyssia. Say, my burning ones are really tough. They do lots of damage all by themselves. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just take an astral pretender. Let's take this guy. He's easy. He's cheap. Get my astral up to seven. Make sure I can be a big astral force in the game. And let's give my guys magic weapons, give them fate weaving, and let's invest most of our points into productivity, leave growth at neutral, get some order, and leave ourselves like this. That's a good investment and a wake. Let's go with a little more this. We get less bad events. Go with some more magic. Now let's, let's do this kind of build. So we have our main heavy duty sacred troops can fill a lot of roles. There are tanky frontliners. They're durable. They still do tons of damage and heat does tons of fatigue damage. They're slow, but we just need them to hold the line. They're standing there doing damage for us. When they fate weave, they make everybody get bad luck after they hit them. So when they're getting hit, they're surviving the hit most of the time and they're benefiting the rest of our troops because now that our mages and the rest of our troops are getting more damage, they have magic weapons to handle ethereal troops and hold things off because they do hit like trucks anyway without any investment. And now you have huge research boosts, tons of income coming in as a bonus, reducing unrest so that further increases your income and you're pushing your heat dominion very powerfully if you do this. So you could even neutralize the bad luck or go with something like growth so you can supplement your blood income. It's a 
small investment needed in a sacreds that already fill a lot of roles and now your mages are way more powerful. This seems like a much stronger bless than sacrificing your pretender and tons and tons of dominion points to be able to get yourself plus five natural protection on a troop that you can only buy at your home province. So try it out guys. Let me know down in the comments any crazy bless ideas that you've come up with with different nations. I love to see them. I love to see them. So send them my way. Let me know what you guys have found and let me know if you think you found the perfect bless, the one that makes it so your troops just can't die, can't lose. And then I'll talk to you guys on the next one. Thank you